Get ready to blast off into the incredible world of brain-computer interfaces. Neuro careers doing the impossible is taking you on a journey to meet the fearless pioneers pushing the boundaries of what's possible. In this special series, we'll be shining a spotlight on the nominees and winners of the International BCI Award, one of the biggest and most prestigious awards in the BCI world. You'll hear from BCI professionals as they share their revolutionary work and get a behind-the-scenes sneak peek at what it takes to be a winner. So, buckle up, grab a snack, and get ready to be amazed as we explore the impossible becoming a reality in the world of BCIs. But before we blast off, I want to give a big thanks to the co-host of this BCI Award edition on our podcast, Dr. Christoph Guger and GTEC Medical Engineering. When I was a faculty member at the University of Cincinnati and Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, my team and I did some pretty amazing stuff for patients needing epilepsy surgery. We would put special sensors, also called grids, directly on their brain to prepare for surgery and create maps of their brain in a much faster and safer way than is usually done. It's called high gamma mapping, and it lets us figure out in just a few minutes the essential parts of the brain that need to be spared during surgery. Can you imagine? You can create a map of language, motor, and even mass processing in no time. It was the first time this innovative technology was used at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. When I moved to Florida, I established the first functional brain mapping and BCI program at Florida Hospital. I continue to use high gamma mapping to help epilepsy patients avoid losing their ability to speak or move after surgery. But even cooler than that, I created brain-computer interface studies that let patients control things with their brain in real time. Our patients could even spell words with incredible speed by just using their brains. No hands involved. I also discovered that brain-computer interfaces could help patients move their chronically impaired hands or legs years after a stroke when not much else could help them. So, I started working with the faculty from Advent Health University to help these patients restore their ability to use their hands. I received special training for it, and it's still mind-blowing how cool it is. My favorite part of what I do is teaching. At my established Institute of Neuro Approaches, I've integrated all my experience and knowledge into a unique course on brain-computer interfaces. With graduate neurobiology students, we started with theory, and then I gave them the BCI equipment so they could have hands-on experience working with BCIs. It significantly improved the way students learn, and they absolutely love this practical part of learning how to use neurotechnology. And all of this was made possible thanks to GTEC's awesome brain-computer interface technology. They have everything from high-tech up to 1,024-channel EEG systems to wearables, tools for neurorehabilitation, such as the medical-grade system recoveries, and 
educational kits with unicorn hybrid block for learning how to work with BCI technology. But the most important part is their support and care. I have enjoyed working and collaborating with Dr. Christoph Guger and GTEC employees for over 15 years, and I hope for many more successful years ahead. So, if you are interested in GTEC's brain computer interfaces and neurotechnologies, check out their website at gtech.net. It's worth it. Dear NeuroCareers podcast listeners, welcome to a new episode of the NeuroCareers podcast BCI Award Series. Today, we are about to embark on a journey into the world of brain-computer interfaces, BCIs, and the remarkable work of Vincent Ron. In 2022, a project was published in Scientific Reports, offering a glimpse into the future of BCIs. Vincent Ron and his team have introduced an exciting concept, the auto-adaptive BCI, AABCI. This innovation aims to break free from the conventional constraints of BCI technology, particularly the need for extensive calibration and training sessions. At its core, the project addresses a fundamental challenge, ensuring that BCIs understand and respond to the user's intentions accurately. Vincent's approach involves two key components, motor task performance, MTP decoders, and control decoders. Vincent's work showcases the versatility of the AABCI across different BCI paradigms, from controlling a virtual four-limb exoskeleton to precise 2D cursor control. The project's success story unfolds through an online simulation study using data from a tetraplegic individual during a BCI clinical trial. The results, as documented in their publication in scientific reports, are nothing short of remarkable, with the AABCI outperforming traditional training methods. Vincent Ron's contributions reflect the spirit of innovation and inclusivity in BCI research. His work holds the promise of transforming the lives of individuals with severe motor disabilities, paving the way for a brighter future in BCI technology. Welcome, Vincent. It's a great pleasure to have you today on our podcast. Thank you so much for coming. Can you please introduce yourself and tell our listeners where you're joining us from, from what part of the world? Okay, yeah. Thanks for having me on this podcast, Milena. Uh, so I'm a young uh, BCI scientist. I finished my PhD last year at the Kinetech in Grenoble. And now I moved to Switzerland because of all the interesting stuff that's going on uh, uh, around around there. Uh, so yeah, I'm currently uh, looking for my, my new position in the in the PCI field in, uh, in Switzerland. Thank you very much for your introduction. I hope that this podcast might also help you to find your next position. So who knows? <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your path into neurotechnologies? How did you start working with BCIs? What prompted you to join this exciting field? So my entry into the field of BCI uh, started when I met Jose Milan, who was at the time a teacher at the PFL, where I did my master's and my bachelor. And he had this course that was called Brain Computer Interfaces. And I had absolutely no clue what that was about. And I read the, the intro about the course and I was, okay, no way, that's true. It's not possible. And I, I went into this course and I was extremely surprised about about what was being done. Um, although you, when you think about brain computer interface and you have no idea what it is you think, you're going to control tons of stuff in your mind. And it was only a P300 speller. And I was still like, okay, that's awesome. That's what I want to be doing with my life. And so I started taking courses with uh, Jose Milan and all of his lab at PFL. So I did, uh, I did master's project internship in industry at MindMaze as well. And uh, then I did uh, a semester project with Ricardo Chavarega, who, who was also at uh, José Milan's lab. Very interesting people. And I kept working with, uh, with this team. 
uh, until Jose moved to Texas in Austin, where I decided, okay, I'm not going to go that far away for now. And I found this uh, PhD opportunity at Clinatech, which is uh, which was one of the few clinical trials for BCI at the time with invasive BCIs. And it was also in the field that I was interested in, which was um, correlates of error potentials in the brain for something which is, to me, one of the most important fields in BCIs, which is auto-adaptation of uh, control decoders, which is the, the main topic of this submission that I did for the BCI awards. So since I'm a young researcher, it's kind of a short background, but that's how I stumbled into this field. Yes, and that is a very exciting background. So how did that class of Jose Milan convince you that actually BCIs, it's something that is possible versus what you thought about before that, you know, the no way? The theory was very interesting, but we had also this practical project uh, which started with one of my mentors at the time, which was called Kua Lee, and he was working on the effects of vestibular feedback on the detection of, uh, on the accuracy of detection of a seed stand uh, detection for an exoskeleton. So we were in this, we were ourselves, we, me and my team of students, we were in this exoskeleton and trying to do motor imagery for sitting and standing. And we either had uh, feedback with the exoskeleton moving, so we had vestibular feedback of movement or not. And we could see we had some also some neurofeedback on the screen for the detection of motor imagery. And we could clearly see that it was working, that we were actually doing some motor imagery and it was detecting it in real time. And it was the first time that we had some real experiment showing, okay, brain computers interfaces are usable and you can actually control stuff with this. So <laughs> it was it was awesome. Absolutely, yes. And uh, I can hear that excitement in your voice. So what was your background? Were you studying engineering, uh, neural engineering? What did you study to work in this field? I studied a mix between neuroscience and computer science. There's this bachelor and, and master's at EPFL in Lausanne, which is called Life Science and Technologies. And they have a variety of courses, which are mostly on the neuroscience part, but they try to make it as easy as possible to mix it with different courses. And they give you a lot of programmation courses and so on. So I mixed it with data science. And as soon as I discovered the field of creating computer interfaces during my first year of master's, I tried to take as much machine learning courses, signal processing courses, and all of the, the other courses that are related to brain computer interfaces. So a lot of signal processing, machine learning, and neuroscience, which is kind of interesting because it enables you to understand what you're doing with the PCI. If you're only doing the machine learning part, it's it's interesting, but you, it's not as uh, as in depth, I'd say, as understanding why it works and how it works and what kind of brain signals you're recording. Mm -hmm. So, what would be those specific courses that you would recommend to get in depth to understand why behind um, what's going on with BCIs? Mm -hmm. I think it's mandatory to have some basic neuroscience understanding, like understanding what you're recording. Actually, like if you're doing some. Uh, ECOG or EG, you're not going to record the same thing as if you're doing some intracortical, I mean, some um, invasive, like, I don't know the English word for this, but these things that are the black rock arrays and, and this kind of recording systems, which are actually recording uh, action potentials and single neurons or multiple neurons instead of local field potentials. So understanding all of this is, I think, mandatory as a first step into uh, before going into PCIs. And then, if you, then I think there is a large part of it, which is uh, signal processing, because you need to have some clean data before you can apply any kind of machine learning techniques. Uh, I'd be worried that someone that doesn't know the field would like to know a lot about the machine learning part and just go into algorithms and, and all the awesome stuff and theoretical stuff that you can do with machine learning. But if you don't have some clean data and some deep understanding of the data itself, it's going to be much harder. So I'd go for yeah, neuroscience and signal processing at first. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And probably you were mentioning penetrating electrodes, yes? Or, um, yes, yes the depth electrodes for, uh, for LFP recordings. Mm. Um, yes, like Black Rock uh, Neurotech. Very good. Thank you for this advice. And as you spend your study time at EPFL, 
Can you tell our listeners a little bit about this institution? What is it known for? Uh, as people are listening to us from all over the world, so it's interesting to hear about institutions who are offering these amazing BCI programs. Okay, so EPFL is a university city which is based in Switzerland, in the city of Lausanne, which is on the French-speaking part of Switzerland. Uh, it has a very large uh, amount of different courses that you can take. You can go into architecture, into computer science, into uh, life science. There are some masters, I think, in economics, but they are less known. Um, and I think it's considered quite a, a good school. Uh, I, I mean, I'm biased in this evaluation, but, and, but I loved it. The, the teachers are very interesting because it's, a, it's not only it's a school, but in the university center, there's a lot of research going on over there. And there's a mix with companies as well, with a lot of spin-offs and startups that are created from these labs. So I think it's a hub of uh, knowledge for students, but also for development for research and industry as well. So it's a very exciting place to do your uh, your um, bachelor or master's or even your PhD. And I would encourage anyone listening to this to uh, just check the APFL website and see what you can do there. Mm -hmm. Yes, sounds exciting. And, and now about your project that you did at Clinatech. I know that it is a very, very interesting project that can bring lots of value to disabled people. You already mentioned that was one of the few places that already was doing clinical trials in um, people with tetraplegia, uh, with paralysis in general. Can you tell a little bit more about this place, about this project in particular that you were involved in? So the, this project revolves a lot about the, the creation, I mean, building from scratch, uh, a complete environment that can be used for tetraplegics. I mean, from my understanding of it, because I was only part of the project, uh, the, the goal was to create this implant, so this ECOG implant that can be used for tetraplegics and make it a, a medical device that can be used in other studies after this clinical trial, uh, which is now the case. It's uh, used in some clinical trials uh, over the world, I think in Switzerland as well and to also develop tools such as an exoskeleton or modify existing tools uh, like a wheelchair to make it controllable using this brain-computer interfaces. So it's a very pluridisciplinary team that works on a lot of different stuff. There is a lot of electrical engineering, uh, some mechanics, some robotics, and different people all coming together to try to uh, make it accessible for tetraplegic people uh, to have another way of controlling their body. So it's very exciting and uh, yeah, I hope it will be promising for the future as well. For now, I thought it was very interesting, but let's see how far we can go with this kind of technology. Yes, absolutely. And uh, when I first heard about this concept that was developed in Grenoble, as I understood, it was the whole building, the whole big institute dedicated just for developing this type of device. So as I understood, there was the floor dedicated, let's say, to surgery, uh, to uh, work with animals and um, another for, uh, let's say, data science. So I might not have all the information, but this was the concept that I just imagined how it looks like. Can you give us a glimpse, you know, what is it about this institution where this amazing project is being developed? So, so this is, you're bringing up a very interesting point, which is the, the facilities and how they're built to accommodate for this kind of project. So the BCI project of Kinetech is not the only one that is uh, uh, ongoing over there. The, the goal of these uh, facilities uh, is to make a, create an interface between the hospital itself, which is the Shuga, the Colonel Hospital, and engineers. So you have in the same building and uh, neurosurgery, room for neurosurgery, room for a patient with qualified nurse, doctors, and all of this medical environment combined with like one floor above, all of the engineering team, the people that are building the exoskeleton, the people that are creating this uh, recording devices, the animal labs and all of this stuff. So it's a mix between the two in one big building, which enables a much faster and more uh, dynamic uh, collaboration between two fields, two worlds that are quite close, but sometimes have troubles communicating in between themselves, between the medical uh, field itself and engineers. 
So yes, that's why this building was created. And I think the, I would say the BCI project is, is the bigger one in scale, but they have very interesting research in uh, epilepsy in Parkinson and other domains and with a lot of animal studies as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, did you uh, notice this advantage of having multiple people from different fields in one place? How did it maybe improve the access or understanding of the project for you personally? I think it brings some, I wouldn't say disadvantages, but challenges because you're tackling a, a gigantic task of creating the implant, the exoskeleton. and so there's a lot of work and you need a lot of people. And as long as you have a, a common view and you know where you're driving your project, which was done by the, uh, the the management teams, if they have a clear idea of what they want to do, you can just have everyone uh, agree on this direction and just work together. Then you have to still go through the the, the problem, let's say, of communication and understanding stuff that is very technical and complicated when it's not your field. So uh, understanding why you only have this kind of, let's say, uh, frequency um for recording of the brain signals because they have to make this implant, which is being that surgery has to be a very small, it has to be approved for medical use. And there's a lot of, of technical stuff that you, and no one can understand all of the technical stuff, but you have to understand why it's done by your colleagues and then focus on your own work and explaining why you're doing your own. So it's a, it's a collaborative project and you need to have good communication skills, I say, to, to be able to work in this kind of environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for giving us this glimpse into this amazing, amazing project. Let's go a little bit closer to the project you were involved in. Who were the main participants, the main targeted population that you wanted to help with your work, with your research? So the, the, this project the, in the clinical trial at the at Grenoble is specifically targeted for tetraplegic people. So disabled people that have very limited control over their upper limb. Um, the people that are involved, in, including in the clinical trial that I worked with, still had some uh, residual control over their upper limb. So they can could move like part of the hand or the part of the, the arm, um, but not it's not useful enough in, in everyday situations. So we're trying to give some agency to these people to have some more control over locomotion mainly in their daily life. Um, so that's the main goal of the clinical trial. And as for myself, I'm very interested in helping people that are disabled, but also bringing BCI to healthy individuals, which most likely won't be made through this kind of invasive devices, but any kind of research in the field of BCI helps going through uh, toward that goal. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree. Now, if we focus on people with tetraplegia, can you describe this device and how it is supposed to work so that then we can see what's maybe not working very well and what you were trying to improve? Yes, yeah, so let's just get to the basics. Sure, sure. So the, the, the main devices, let's say the, the most interesting one and the most complex one as well, is this exoskeleton with four limbs. So the, the patient can be attached to this exoskeleton and then can try to control both walking states and the position of the arm in the, of both hands in three dimensions. So when you think about all of this, it's a lot of degrees of freedom. You have uh, the position in three of the hand, which is three per hand in a continuous environment. Then we also had the um, rotation of the wrist and walking or being idle. So uh, a very complex and uh, um, output environment. You have a lot of output variables which are continuous. So it's a model, when you create a model in machine learning that tries to control this kind of complex effector with complex outputs, you need a lot of data and you need to be, to, to ensure that your subject is gonna be able to control it properly. So that's the main goal. And when you are trying to make, create this kind of model, you are, you have to face one of the big challenges, which is a training session and recording sessions, which is how you acquire your lab and data in order to train your models. And this is where you get to the hard stuff, like how I'm going to be able to train a model that can be used for 
long period of time and that he's going to be able to control such a complex effector as, a, as an exoskeleton. And this is where it gets very interesting. Yeah, thank you so much. And can you talk a little bit about the signal that we're recording? So it's ECOG signal. What electrodes are we using? Where are they being implanted? Can you give us some details? Sure, sure. So the the implant themselves are based, are implanted over the sensory motor cortex because it's the best uh, area to record, which is known as motor imagery. For people that don't know what motor imagery is, it's like uh, not to moving your arm, but trying to move your arm and it's not moving. It's not exactly the same as imagined movement. It's not like you're imagining to move your, your own arm. It's like you're trying to move your arm and it's not moving, which is exactly the case for tetraplegic actually. And uh, it's been shown in literature that you can record this kind of signal over this, so in the somatosensory cortex. So that's why these electrodes were placed uh, over here. And if I'm correct, I think they did some preliminary studies to uh, place the electrodes over the the area where they had the best signals during non-invasive recordings. So they did some pre preliminary recordings to check which exact part of the somatosensory cortex was the best target for these electrodes. And that's how they did their implementations. Mm -hmm. Yes, so they did functional mapping to identify where the function is prior to exactly. implantation surgery. Yes, so this is what uh, we do usually in patients uh, for pre-surgical evaluation uh, as well for brain surgery. Uh, yes, excellent. What are those recording electrodes? Are they wired? Are they wireless? Uh, how do they work? Because we know that there is such a variety of different electrodes, and I know that for this project, very specialized implantable electrodes were developed. And so it was a long time even uh, and a lot of effort to develop these electrodes. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. I mean, I, I cannot go into details because as I mentioned, it's definitely not my background, the electrical engineering and the, the creation of this implant themselves. But it is a wireless system, which means uh, when you don't have the full recording system in place, you cannot see anything on the, on the, on the patient. You don't have this, uh, this let's not say issue, but impracticality of uh, fully implantable, I mean, non-fully implantable implants, uh, which, where you have wires that go out of the of the school, which are have a lot of risk uh, associated with uh, infection and durability, and you don't, you cannot have access with them. I mean, it's pretty safe, but it's even safer to not have anything that is, uh, is poking out of your, of your school. So fully implantable implants, um, which are very miniature, I mean, very small, it's, Basically, the implant is only the size of the, the electrode grid. So you have all the space for the electrode grid, and then you have um, the, the PCB on top of this and the antenna, and that's, that's pretty much all you have. Uh, so very interesting technology, and uh, this, is, this was one more challenge to be able to make it wireless. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, it's so good that you mentioned that they're really very small because on the pictures in the articles, of course, they are magnified, yes, to, to show everything in them and the electrodes, and they look big. So when I imagine them <laughs> in, in, in the brain, um, I imagine them as really uh, big and robust. But uh, yeah, as, as you mentioned, it's, it's not that big. Of course, it's a great advantage of having wireless electrodes to record the signal. I also remember hearing some work that was done to keep the temperature of the electrode no higher than certain level, not to provide any damage to the tissue, to the uh, to the brain. So it it I'm just I want to emphasize the very complex work that was done to develop these electrodes that can be used now safely in uh, in patients. So I'm just a fan of this project. <laughs> yes, I, I didn't be able to go into details, but as you mentioned, there are a lot of small important parts that are equally important that makes this, pro this project possible. And without uh, the uh, contribution of all of my colleagues uh, that are responsible for this implant, the, this project would definitely not be possible. Yes, yes. So thank you, Vincent. Let's get now into your territory. Yes, that you already um, know and you're expert in. 
So let's explain to our listeners what happens for tetraplegic patients to be able to use this brain-computer interface. So what happens on the computational side? Um, so on the computational side, you have this, uh, this machine learning algorithm, which is in charge of transforming processed brain signals into commands for the exoskeleton. Let's keep it with the exoskeleton as an effector for now. So you have this machine learning algorithm and the pre-processing. The pre-processing is a very important part in order to not have just noise because when you're recording brain signals, you're picking up a lot of stuff, which are can be movement artifacts, which can be um, electrical artifacts or even unrelated brain signals because you have a lot of stuff that is going on in your brain and you're interested in one specific signal, which I mentioned before, which is the motor imagery signal if you're trying to control something using motor imagery. So this is the part of the, uh, you do as much of this in the signal processing part. And once you have a cleaned up signal and you have extracted what we call features, you can use your machine learning algorithm to try to predict the output. The issue here when you're trying to do this is that you cannot just simply use any kind of machine learning algorithm. You need to have one which is uh, specifically designed for your task in order to train a model, which will be most of the time specific to your patient. And in order to train these models, you need what we call label data, which means you need to have uh, at one point both input signals which are the brain signals, and the output, which is what the subject was trying to do. So, for instance, if we're using the exoskeleton once again, you need to have some recordings where you know what the, the, where the subject is trying to move his hands, for instance, if you're moving your hands. And once you have this level data and you have enough level data, you can train your, your model using these machine learning algorithms, and then you can subsequently control this DCI. So there are a lot of steps that must be performed in order in, a, in order to allow the, the subject to control the, the brain-computer interface. Yes. And uh, what are the problems of using this supervised learning algorithm in these patients? Why did you decide to change anything in it? So there are, there are many issues. The, the first one is the one that I briefly mentioned before is the dimension of the output space. I, imagine you're trying to, what we're basically trying to do is to map an output space with, uh, as closely as possible. And if you want to have data to map all of this output space, uh, the larger the output space is going to be, the more data you're going to need. It's kind of a kind of the curse of dimension, but for the output space. So this is one of the big problems in when you're trying to make more and more complex PCIs. And the second thing is that um, when you're training your model, it will be usable for some period of time and you're trying to make it usable for as long as you can. But due to variability in brain signals or uh, changes in the, the strategy of control of the user or many kinds of different reasons, your model is going, can have lower performances over time. So you need a lot of data for the, to, to train these models during which the user cannot control the BCI because you need to ask him to perform specific tasks so the user cannot do what he wants to do. And at some, at some point, you're going to have to retrain this model, let's say, wasted time for the user himself. So usability is not that high. And that's what I tried to, to challenge in, the, in my project, which is try to go toward being able to train these models without having to give the patient specific tasks. So the user can just freely use the BCI and then we're going to train the models. And it would be a, a huge improvement for the time used in the, in the training of these models. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, just to make it very visual for our listeners, the biggest problem for a user is really to use their time instead of working, yes, or moving in training session. Yes, so basically uh, listen to what they're being told and do the exact task. And the more we want to receive as an output, the more we want them to be able to do, the more complex those movements are, the more data we need to collect. And so how often do we usually need to perform those training sessions? And how long can they take? It depends a lot on the tasks you're trying to perform. Like if you're using a P300 speller, there are some of them that can be used uh, 
without any training because you pre-train your model on other individuals and with transfer learning, you can actually make something that is usable without any training. But then if you're trying to do control something more complex, you're going to need a, a model that is going to be more specific to your user because you can because you want to improve accuracy. So uh, you can go between no training for this kind of P300 spatter to a few weeks of recordings for more complex effectors. So then you have to make sure that your model is stable over time. And I think that was one of the big takeaway of the BCI project at Tinatec is that the model that they we managed to create was stable for a few months. So after, I don't remember how many months, but uh, a few months, the, the subject was still able to use the model that was trained months ago to control the exoskeleton. So the position of the arms in three dimension, which was quite impressive. Yes, it is very impressive. And I'm very curious, how is this problem of uh, the need to collect training data is being solved in other laboratories, uh, in other places? What are the current approaches that are being used? I think one of the most used approaches, which is very promising, is transfer learning, which is trying to use models that are trained for uh, another task or on another subject for your specific task. Uh, basically, it's uh, using uh, a model that was trained on data, which is different than on the data that is going to be used on. So most of the time, it's trying to train a model on one subject and make it work for next sessions, like for months and months on hand, or try to train a model on a group of subjects. And then when you have a new subject, you just use this model of uh, as this average model let's say and try to make it work so i think that's very promising it's not the direction that we went uh, toward in in my project but it, it is very promising for the future um, and i think that's the most commonly used technique to to solve this issue one of the other technique that is used is one which is very close to the one that I'm using uh, in my project, which is unsupervised learning. It's like trying to use data which is not labeled instead of using labeled data in order to train your model. So in some experiment, it was done from scratch. So for non-complex DPIs such as the say a speller, you can actually train the control decoder, which is the one that is controlling the, the, the BCI without uh, requiring these specific training sessions where the user cannot choose what he wants to do. So you put the user in front of the speller, you, get it, you tell the user to spell whatever they want, and at first the accuracy will be quite low because the model is not trained, but without even asking the, the subject to choose specific letters, you will be able to train the model slowly. So unsupervised learning is also promising, I'd say, and a, a good way to solve these kind of issues. Yes, so if we're talking about uh, the... Uh, learning transfer, uh, it, it is still would be considered a supervised approach because it was supervised on other people, on other models, and then we're transferring it to this particular subject, yes, or patient. Is that correct? Yes, I mean, they could still use some unsupervised technique, but if you're using supervised learning to train your other model that you're transferring, it would be, I would call it a, a supervised technique as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. So can you give us a glimpse into the distinction of supervised versus unsupervised learning? Uh, sure. So as I mentioned, the way we train models is by uh, having both access to the input data, which is brain signals, and output data, which is uh, what the subject is trying to perform. Uh, this is for supervised learning only, actually. If you're performing unsupervised learning, you won't have access to this output data. You will only have access to the input data, and then you can try to say, okay, all of this input data over here looks the same. So let's say it's one category, and all of this input data over here is, looks kind of different, but all of the same as well. And let's say it's another category. So you have machine learning algorithms that are able to detect it to uh, let's say, sort data this way, which are unsupervised learning algorithms, and they can be useful for classification and, uh, and, and other tasks like this. But I would say that if you're trying to control something which is, if you're trying to perform regression, which is control of uh, something which is continuous, uh, it's going to be hard to use. Like, I doubt you'd be able to have unsupervised learning for control of effectors which have multiple continuous outputs. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and now you said that transfer learning is one of the approaches that is currently being used to solve this problem of, you know, additional training. 
why didn't you choose to work and maybe improve some of the transfer learning methodologies? Uh, why did you decide to go a different route uh, more into unsupervised learning? I think it's very specific to the project we were working on. If I was working on some something which was less precise, I would go with transfer learning, but I think we cannot use it for now. If I was to continue working on that project, at some point, I would envision to use transfer learning, but for a different task. I don't think I will go into more details later during this podcast. But here we are working with a sensor motor cortex, with a motor imagery, which is going to be very specific depending on the location of the electrodes and the, the patient themselves, what kind of, of motor imagery strategy they're going to develop for the control of the of the, the exoskeleton. So even if they're trying to use biomimetic control strategies, which is, okay, I try to move my arm to the right to move the arm to the right and not think I'm moving my pinky to move the arm to the right. Uh, even if they use this same strategy, you're not going to be guaranteed that it's going to activate the exact same spot in the brain and that your electrodes are going to be placed exactly the same. So transfer learning would be kind of hard to use, I'd say, in this kind of condition. I think it should be investigated, but the, the reason why I did not want to go into this is because it seemed like it would be low probability of success. And at that time, we did not have enough subjects to be able to properly perform transfer learning. So uh, that's also one of the major reasons why I did not try to, to achieve this. Yes, thank you very much. And it's very interesting what you just said, how individual can be that signal that is recorded uh, over the sensory motor cortex. Yes, that it can be very unique to each user. And dependent on that, uh, we would need to classify signal in different ways and uh, use different approaches. Uh, now, uh, can you then tell about your approach? You also mentioned that there are some attempts uh, similar to yours that are using unsupervised learning. Yeah, so we're just getting deeper and deeper. So what is the difference from what is already done and uh, approach that you uh, proposed? Okay, so let's get into this. So what I'm doing, what what I was doing during this project is supervised learning as well, but it, let's say it's a hierarchical supervised learning because you're training one model and this model is going to be used to train another model. And the, the first model that you're training, like the one that is in charge of training the second one, is, a, is supposed to be able to detect when the subject is, let's say, happy or satisfied with the, the output of the of the exoskeleton, let's say the user tried to move his hands to his hands to the right and they move to the left, then the user is obviously not going to be happy. And on the other hand, if it works according to what they were expecting, you can expect the user to be happy. And if you're able to detect this uh, signal of, let's say, satisfaction or error in the, in the context of the individual, then you can have feedback on whether the, uh, the, the movement of the exoskeleton was correct. And if you think about it, the movement of the exoskeleton is actually decided by the second decoder, which is the control decoder, the one that is actually in charge of uh, transforming the brain signal into commands. So if you're able to detect this satisfaction signal in the brain, then you have a glimpse of whether the, the other decoder is functioning correctly or if it's making mistakes. Then if you're, if you're able to know if it's making mistakes or if it's doing its job properly, you can try to use this information to update it and train it. So using, let's say, the sort of the basic idea here is like, if you say this, give the same example and you have the hands of the exoskeleton that is moving to the right when the subject was trying to make it move to the right and you detect that it is correct, then you can use the brain signals that were recorded with this movement and this output and say, okay, this is label data now. Even if you did not instruct the subject to do this movement, he did it on his own free own, by his free will, you have some label data. So when the movement is correct, you can have easily obtainable uh, label data. And then the trick is what do you do when the movement is incorrect? Like let's say the, the hands of the exoskeleton went to the left and you detect that it was a mistake. You don't have access to what the, the, the subject was trying to do. So now you need to derive a way to label this data in order to be able to use it. Else you will only be able to train the, the model when the, 
the subject is making correct movement. And that is very unlikely when you're starting with a decoder that is completely random at, at, at the beginning. So this is for the quick links of how it works. The, the goal is to detect some kind of error correlates or satisfaction correlates in the cortex in order to be able to label data that you can use to train your control decoder. Very interesting approach. And you mentioned this at the very beginning of our podcast, uh, your interest in error potentials. Yes. Yeah, so this is where it's coming from. So can you tell us more about that? How can we detect errors and uh, satisfaction versus not satisfaction directly from the human brain? Yes. Yeah, so what... What is, exists in the literature is the detection, what is mostly known is the detection of a, a neural correlate, which is called the error-related potential, which is a central um, of, the, of the skull. And it's been used uh, for spellers as well. For instance, been during my, one of my first projects, I was working with Ricardo Chavarega, as I mentioned, he was making a speller that was functioning using reinforcement learning and detection of error potentials to navigate. And it was actually quite impressive. And that's what's mainly used in implementation of this uh, BCI, because what I'm doing is not completely new. People had this idea before, but there are some issues with the error-related potential, and that makes it quite unsuited for this kind of complex task. So this error-related potential appears when you have um, visual stimuli or a stimuli, whatever it is, that is incongruent with what was expected uh, which was the, the error that was expected by the by the user. So it's a waveform, which means that it is time-locked to an event. Uh, you need to have some kind of specifically erroneous or correct event to have it appear in the in the brain. And that makes it kind of quite easy to detect in some cases, but very hard to detect in other cases. And that's the, the basis for one of the novelties that I introduced in my project. So the idea is that I think that error-related potentials are unsuited for complex effectors because let's say you're trying to control your hands once again in a 3D environment and there is, won't be any discrete event that say, okay, this is cor correct or erroneous. Let's say you're trying to reach one point and your hand is slowly deviating from the, uh, the accepted trajectory. There's no time point at which say, okay, this is definitely incorrect and this is definitely correct. Unless you're making some movement that are in a straight line and then that deviates at once, but that's not how you can expect movement to occur all of the time. So that was the main reason why I decided to go away from error-related potentials uh, as they are known and try to detect some kind of new neural correlates in the, in the brain that could work with this kind of complex movement. And this is the big novelty, I'd say, compared to other studies, which are all using error-related potentials uh, because they don't have this issue of complex movement because no one is doing this kind of complex movement for now unless for uh, in, in very invasive recordings and people have not tried to make this kind of auto-adaptive strategies yet. I think this is the first try in such a complex setting, so that, uh, the one that we had in, in Kinetic. So that's the reason why other tests in the past were not suitable for what we're doing right now. Yes, very, very interesting. So what is your novelty? If you are not recording uh, this error, uh, negativity potential, yes, that is time locked, uh, that cannot be used for complex movement. So what is your alternative? The idea was, okay, I cannot really record something that is time locked, so I have to record something that is not time locked, but uh, does it exist? And that's what I could realize. The, the idea is very simple, but no one did it before, I guess, or it was never published, uh, at least. And uh, the idea is, okay, uh, we have this continuous movement in more than one dimension, because when you have a continuous movement in one dimension, if you actually change the movement, it's a discrete event. Let's say you go walking a straight line and you go in the other direction. Okay, it's a continuous movement, but at one point you have a reverse of direction, so it can be seen as a discrete event as well. Uh, that wouldn't really work out with the, the continuous errors that appears in 2D movement or 3D movements. So the idea was to have this kind of 3D or 2D movement and say, okay, can I continuously detect if the user is happy or not? I mean, with the, the current state of the VCI. So instead of detecting these kind of correlates only at the time of events, you try to detect them continuously. And if you are able to train a, a machine learning model that is able to detect them, then it does not prove that the signal exists, but it's a good giveaway that there is something in the brain and that is correlated to a continuous performance for motor tasks, for instance, as we have here. 
So that's what we did uh, with my colleagues, first in very simple settings with a discrete effector, because even if it's discrete, you can try to detect the motor task performance, as we call them, continuously in time, instead of detecting it only at specific time events. And we were very surprised and happy to discover that we were indeed able to detect this uh, new kind of error correlates uh, that are continuous in time and not simply time locked or even locked. And then we went further and escalated this uh, this paradigm to more complex uh, situations, like the the one you mentioned at first, with uh, four discrete class of control for an exoskeleton, and finally for the one that is actually the most interesting because it's the closest one to to the exoskeleton. It's the uh, control of a cursor continuously in two dimensions. And even during these very complex tasks, we were able to to detect uh, erroneous movement continuously in time and correct movement continuously in time. So this was the first big step at of this project, which is, okay, we're able to detect this new kind of error correlates that were never seen before in the sensory motor cortex, uh, which are going to be able to unlock new kind of auto-adaptive strategies for these PCIs. That is absolutely amazing. I'm very curious to see what are the features of those uh, neural correlates of uh, erroneous movement. So what do you find when you are analyzing this signal? Yes, yeah, so, okay. So it, it's very hard to go into detail, the, let's say, orally about the, about this. It's because you have... We had the, the, the feature that we were using were both spatial, uh, temporal, and frequential because we were using time frequency information based on the existing literature for detection of error correlates in the sensory motor cortex. And uh, I, I, it's pretty hard to say, okay, it's this frequency band at that specific point, at that time in point. I would advise any interested people to read, uh, I don't think it's in the article that you mentioned, but it's in my thesis, which should be open access. So don't hesitate to just look it up and you have these maps for every single paradigm and uh, every single uh, kind of detection of uh, which features are important for this detection of this continuous motor task performance uh, correlates. Yeah, thank you so much. Maybe we can even add uh, both links into your article and to your thesis into our podcast notes so that our listeners can read about this. But it's really, really fascinating. Can you also talk a little uh, bit more about this auto-adaptive uh, approach that you developed? Yes, so you called it a ABCI. And also, where else do you see this approach to work? Uh, where can it be applied? Okay, so yeah, I, I can for sure speak more about the auto-adaptive BCI approach because the detection of these neural correlates is only the first step. It's uh, just the building block that is necessary, but it's not the, the whole thing. Uh, as I mentioned, then you, once you're able to detect these uh, neural correlates of task performance in the sensory motor cortex, you still have to create levels in order to train your control decoder. So how are we doing this? For the a, a, for a simple example, which is like, say, a binary classification task, is very easy to detect an error news output, you just select the other one and it's going to be correct because if one is ever news, the other one is correct. Relabeling is very straightforward. Then if you go into something which is classification, but for multi-class, um, I would say there are many different approaches that can be done. The easiest one, I think, is the one we did, is if you detect an error, you say, okay, this is not the correct class and you just select the second most probable class as the correct output. So for this, you need to have um, a control decoder that gives you not only one output, but a probability of each class of being correct. And then you select the second most probable class as the correct level. You could also uh, use weighted levels and say, okay, now I'm using some kind of uh, probabilistic framework and uh, say my probability of this one being correct uh, goes to zero, this class being correct. And the other one, instead of saying, okay, this second most probable class is the correct class, you say this one is, let's say, 70% probable and these other ones is... 30% probable, and you could train uh, your model in some more complex way. But that was not the point of this proof of concept, let's say. And finally, you have the, the I'd say, the challenge part, which is how do you estimate labels when you have continuous control? So once again, if you take the example of the, of the paradigm that I had in my paper, uh, if you're controlling your cursor in a 2D environment continuously, and you detect uh, some period of time, which is erroneous. You say, okay, this direction was not correct, but which is the correct direction? 
you need to be able to have a correct direction in order to be able to estimate the labels. So here we, once again, for this proof of concept, went with the simplest way, which is we discussed with the subject, okay, um, what is the threshold for you to consider movement correct? So, and we went to something which is, okay, if I'm less than 60 degrees away from the target, I would say this is approximately correct. And the way we did this is we actually labeled the epochs as correct for the training of this decoder when they were 60 degrees close to the target. And for the training of the decoder, we also labeled lab, uh, event as erroneous, only the direction of the movement was what is 120 degrees away from the target, which means that when you detect an error, train with this decoder, and you invert the direction, you're going to be into the 60 degrees range from the target, which is considered correct by the exhaust, by the user. So maybe early it's not that clear, but uh, you can have some tricks, let's say, that enables one to label the data to, uh, for, for this kind of complex task. But I would say that the most promising thing for here would be to actually include uh, into the cost function of the uh, machine learning algorithm that you're training the, the, uh, a way to include these errors. Because currently when you're training your machine learning uh, model using your, uh, your algorithm, usually you have a cost function that uh, only penalize mistakes because you know what is the correct direction. And you say, okay, if I'm far away from the correct direction, I'm going to have a high cost function and trying to minimize this cost function. But you could also have something that would say, okay, if I'm too close to mistakes, because what you know during, when you know something is an error, you don't know what is the correct part, you know that this is incorrect. So you could also penalize being too close to a known erroneous uh, direction. It would make optimization, let's say, much harder because then you don't have straightforward cost function and the optimization becomes, I'd say, much more complex with many local minimums. But uh, it would be very interesting, and I think it would be the future of this of this research. Thank you so much, Vincent, for all these uh, details. And my next question is, what was the novelty of your project? What innovative strategies did you use in your computation, in your models that maybe haven't been used before? Hmm, that's a good question. I'm not sure the, there are a lot of uh, novelties on the computational part of it. I think it, the, this project mainly relied on the on novel idea of, okay, how are we, are we going to solve the issue of detecting errors in complex situations? And and the the machine learning part is, I wouldn't say straightforward, but uh, I, I was able to use the same kind of machine learning algorithm that are specifically suited to our issue, which is multidimensional, and uh, and with low amount of data compared to the to the input space, so the the algorithm that was used in the project before, which is the recursive exponentially weighted uh, N way PLS, is very well suited for this. So I did not have to go very far into uh, improving this. Um, I would say maybe I don't know if that counts to answer your question, but there is the trick about. Uh, what kind of data you want to include into your training data set. So as I mentioned before, you have this first decoder, which is which decodes if one movement is, is correct or erroneous, but sometimes you're not going to be sure of whether it's correct or erroneous. You're going to say, okay, maybe 60% correct or 60% erroneous. And if you, in, if you include all of this, all of the data into your training data set for your control decoder, then you're going to have a lot of noise in your labels. So one kind of strategy that you can devise is actually put a threshold and only include some data, only the data that you're sure of uh, is correct or erroneous in your training data set. This way you have less training data, but the quality of the training data itself goes up. Um, it's actually a trade-off between how much time you need to acquire a large enough data set and the quality of your data set. And you can optimize this trade this trade of parameters in order to have a balance between uh, between these two factors. I'm not sure it counts to answer your question, but uh, that's something that was very interesting to to study in the in this project. Yes, absolutely. You answered my question, and I also noticed the frequency range uh, that you used for your data analysis. And uh, I think you mentioned it, it uh, is up to 200 hertz. So you use the whole spectrum of frequencies. You didn't limit it to just low frequencies uh, or you know gamma frequencies. Can you comment a little bit on that? 
Sure. So uh, in the literature, as I mentioned, there uh, were two or three studies, if I remember correctly, that investigated the detection of aerocorrelates in the sensory motor cortex. And most of these studies agreed that uh, the most important frequency band for this was the gamma band. And so we had to include the gamma band since we had access to it because we're currently using ECOG. And then the question was how much of this data we want to include because there is a limitation, which is we need to have this algorithm be able to work in real time. And we have two different machine learning algorithms that need to work in real time, the control decoder and the CMTP decoder. So there, here we had to make some choices. Uh, I was very interested in going into higher frequencies even to 300 Hertz because what I was looking for is a new signal. So we don't really know its signature and the, the broader the frequency range, the more chances I have to detect this signal and to characterize it precisely. So this analysis up to 300 Hertz, I did them offline on, in a non-pseudo uh, online settings. And it, it, the preliminary studies showed that it was, there were no real interest to go above 150 hertz, which is what we're using for the motor imagery decoding itself. So that's the reason why we kept it between 1 and 150 hertz, because okay, we actually need this data for the, the motor imagery decoding. So there's no use in reducing the frequency range. And most of the information was contained in this frequency range. So that's why we were using this specific one. Yep, thank you so much. And my next question is, let's list the main results of your study. What were they? Okay, so I mentioned two intermediary results. The first one is detection of this new uh, signal. And the second one was, okay, we're able to, to extract labels and the labels that we extract are actually correct when we estimate it using the strategy. But then you still have to look at, okay, are we able to use this full paradigm, the auto-adaptive, a paradigm to train control decoders because if you're not able to do this then it's kind of useless and the main result that for uh, was that for different uh, experimental studies which is different uh, effectors we were able to train control decoders that worked they work better than chance level like significantly better than chance level and their performances were lower obviously but not much lower than supervised training uh, which means the training where you have to direct the user to perform a specific task. These studies were not online studies. They were pseudo-online studies in the sense that you have all the uh, technical um, stuff going in pseudo real time, but it was using pre-recorded data. Uh, but it was enough to show that, okay, we can train this, uh, these control decoders accurately and they have quite good performances. Uh, so that was both surprising because I did not expect them to perform that well and uh, very rewarding to see the, the, the work actually uh, paying off in the end that, the, that we managed to make it work. Mm -hmm. And what can be the impact of this work? Again, if we're going back to the problem that you stated at the very beginning, yes, this long time of recording and uh, complexity, how can you estimate the impact of your project on that? It, it's very hard to estimate the impact of the project, but... Uh, I, I would be very happy if the main impact was to have people more interested in this strategy because there was a very high interest for this kind of strategy like 10 to 15 years ago. And now I think it kind of died a little. Uh, and there have been a few studies in the past few years, but it, people are less interested in this topic than they were before. And I think it's very promising. And the study itself, it's it's a building block and a proof of concept, but before being able to use it directly, you would need to replicate it with different subjects and to go online as well. So the impact, I say, it's not limited, but it has to be seen properly. Okay, it's a very good proof of concept and it shows that we can make it work, but it needs some validation before it can be directly used into every kind of the BCI project. Once that is done, however, it would be it very impactful for BCI because it means you can train any kind of BCI using limited amount of time, which is you only need this CMTP decoder to be trained. And then you can just give the BCI to any user and they can have control after they use it for some time of this BCI. 
So I think the impact will be very high, but there are a lot of questions that remain to be answered, like how stable are these CMTP decoders? Uh, can you use transfer learning, as we mentioned before? Because imagine this, yeah, I mentioned that it was very hard to do transfer learning on the motor imagery decoder, but uh, error correlates, like the error-related potential, is known to be detectable using transfer learning between different subjects. So if you have the same basis for these neural correlates, these new ones, then maybe you can also use transfer learning to uh, detect it from in one individual using the decoder of another individual. And this means you only need to train one big decoder for motor task performance, and then you can use it to train any kind of PCI for any kind of user. So this would be incredibly promising, but you need to first show that uh, it is stable across tasks and across participants, which is a big study, I would say. Yes, absolutely. And if you would summarize what became possible with this project that wasn't possible before, what would that be? I think the, the project itself is 100% research. It's not uh, a pl uh, usable right now, so it doesn't unlock anything uh, right now. What it unlocks is uh, something for the future, like a, a, a promise and a, an, an idea that we can go toward uh, BCIs that don't need this extensive training for the models and that are uh, not usable or user-friendly because you need to retrain them all the time. So it, it unlocks a possibility of a future where BCIs can be used like uh, you put them on and you can use them very easily without any need for some complex training environment or some you know, spending hours trying to train them. So that's what it unlocks, like, let's say, a hope for the future of very usable PCIs. Yeah, excellent. And what was the biggest challenge for you in this project and how did you solve it? Mm, I think there were many challenges and Every single research project, I think there's some point where you say, okay, this is not working, it's not going to work, I don't have any solution, and you have to find something. But I wouldn't say there's something very impressive that uh, that happened. Uh, the, the strategy that I mentioned before, like only including data that you're uh, not 100%, but very sure is correct or erroneous, was actually a, let's say a lifesaver, because when you include all of the data uh, in your training pool for your control decoder, then the accuracy of the control decoder is not that great. It's still better than the chance level, but it's very unpromising for the usability of this kind of auto-adaptive PCI. And I, I felt like it was uh, coming up with this idea of, okay, I'm just going to be able to, I, I, I'm not in the, the classic way. I don't need to use all of the data. I can take some time and just use part of the data and the data that I'm sure is correct and make it work and uh, greatly improve the accuracy at the at the small cost of the training data set size and finding this because this is the solution that worked but there were many solutions that did not work before this finding this i think and keep going keeping uh, still going through when people, things are not working well is a big challenge and i was happy that i was able to overcome this I'm just very curious, when you are looking for solutions, yes, the, the ones that you just mentioned, how are you doing it? Are you trying to read literature? Are you going talking to people? Are you just sitting somewhere, you know, quietly and thinking? How does it work for you? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm in the team of uh, sitting quietly uh, in some space and thinking about it, but at some point this is... It's not going to work all the time and you need some help and uh, literature, reading the literature in your field, but also in fields that are close to it, that are related to it, often brings some unexpected uh, results because most of the time, you know, your field by heart, you've read every single paper, but if you go a little bit outside of it, you are very surprised at what's being done and what you say, okay, this is completely usable for my field. So that's one of the big points uh, that helped me. And the second thing is also communicating with colleagues, even even if they're not in your field and they're not in your PhD thesis, because a PhD thesis is a lot of personal work and people are not that involved in what you're doing because they have their own work. Uh, sharing your ideas and explaining what kind of trouble you're meeting can also be very helpful. People have great ideas and sometimes also just saying out loud what you're facing just gives you the solution to say, okay, but the issue is I cannot do this. Uh, I cannot actually perform this task. And then you say, oh, actually I could do it. I just have to do this. And having someone to exchange and be like a mirror of yourself and explain this kind of process uh, gives you a lot of help. 
Yes, thank you so much. Very workable, very practical strategies uh, and looking at a different field, you know, getting outside your own research. I think Dr. Uh, Nicholas Opi from Synchron also mentioned this in uh, the BCI World uh, podcast that we recorded and some um, other of our podcast guests. And also saying it out loud, even for yourself. I have a short uh, episode of, I think, teach your pet fish. So just imagining somebody, you know, talking to somebody, just bringing it out loud, it can uh, definitely help in many situations. So thank you very much for sharing that. And is there anything that you learned during this project that was new or, you know, interesting, interesting or unexpected to you? I had an idea after you said interesting, but after unexpected, it's much harder. Uh, to In some point, it wasn't expected, but I would say it's the importance of proper and clean data, understanding your data more than using some sophisticated machine learning algorithm. Like we've trained tons of different algorithms that are non-usable in real time, some complex uh, neural networks, and it makes way less difference from our results than actually using uh, properly prepared data with proper feature engineering, yeah, making sure you don't have any artifacts, no corrupted data, and, and using only the, the optimal data that you want to use for your, for your decoders to achieve the, the best accuracy. So yeah, I think it's, for me, that was like, the most eye-opening thing, okay, machine learning is cool. The algorithms are very interesting. Doing the math is awesome and understanding it is very, very interesting. And you can always develop more complex machine learning techniques. But if you don't understand the data you're applying to and you don't have proper control over your data sets, then it's not going to be that efficient. Mm -hmm. So what would be your suggestion for having really clean data that you can work with? I'm not sure that's usable in any project, but as I mentioned, I'm still a young researcher, so I'm not sure it's it's suited. But uh, what I always do is, uh, as I have data, I always try to visualize it. Uh, you, For instance, you know what is should be the frequency response of uh, ECOG data, so you just check. You write a quick script, you open your data and check, okay, my response for the data is this spectrum, and it's the expected spectrum, and you have some Baseline recording, like eyes open, eyes closed, you can check that you have the proper alpha waves or stuff like this, just making sure that everything is all right and as expected. And then you can run some things. What I like to do is check outliers in my data sets. For instance, I do all of my epoching, I have all of my epochs, and then you check, okay, is there some epochs that are very different from others? And sometimes you find some very strange things because let's say... Uh, you're looking at frequency information and you had some data loss in your in your recordings because of whatever electrical issues in the electrodes. And then data loss are going to produce very high spikes in your uh, high frequency uh, components. And if it's only once in a while, you're not going to uh, see, see it directly when you're looking at averages or stuff like this. But when you're doing your machine learning uh, algorithm, if you're using RMSE-based cost functions, which are very penalizing for uh, outliers, then it's going to have a huge impact on your model, actually. So I think it's very interesting to try to look for outliers themselves and see if, it's, if there is some non-biological explanation for them. Like, okay, is this some data corruption and stuff like this? Yeah, thank you so much for mentioning that. And uh, it's so important to hear from you that you do visual inspection of the data, uh, of the data and you also visualize it in different ways uh, to make sure that uh, you, you have the proper data to work with versus just, you know, feeding it into uh, the algorithm for, for further processing. And uh, I think we're going back to the issue of uh, having a proper neuroscience background in addition to your computational skills so that you know what frequencies we're talking about, how the signal should look like, and uh, many other factors like this. Uh, what do you think about that? Yes, yes, that's exactly what I had in mind when I said you 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 don't need some neuroscience background, but it's helpful because it's going to make it way easier to notice when something goes wrong in your signal itself. Then you were mentioning, I said visualize, and I like visualizing, but it's not it's not very like say computer savvy to 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 visualize everything. You can also run some test algorithm or test script to just check this kind of thing, but 
I still personally like to look at my data. It's not very, let's say, uh, conventional or it doesn't make much sense, but it's still reassuring for me to look at my data and say, okay, everything looks correct to me. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I 100% agree with you. And you mentioned that you immediately thought about something interesting that you learned during this project. Yes. And then you, you, you went to unexpected. So what would be the uh, that interesting thing that you learned during this project? That was the, the interesting part. It's more for the unexpected part. The unexpected part, I wouldn't say I had some. I mean, the most unexpected parts are always when you you, okay, you think you're right about something and say, okay, I'm going to still test it once more. And then you test the, the 20th test and you should make sure everything is correct. And then you realize that something is actually not correct once again. And you have to find the reason why and go not from scratch, but finding what a solution to this new and expected issue that happened that it was definitely out of your control. And it happens a lot, actually, when you're this kind of multidisciplinary project, because there are many things that are out of your scope, it's not your field, so you, you can't even think about it and you have to stumble upon these things by chance actually to solve them. Yes, thank you. And what would be your next steps uh, in developing this project further? Or if you are not planning to continue with this, uh, what would be your next steps in general in your studies, in, in your career, I would say? I'm very into the field of BCIs and I, I'd like to keep working on this, but I, I think BCIs are and many people agree, are now facing an issue of usability. Uh, this is the main issue that was tackled with this PhD project, but it's the same thing with EG uh, headsets that have issues with like, are you using gel? Can you use these dry electrodes for a long period, extended period of time? Do you have proper signals? And, and I think if we want to have more people involved into the field, we need to have uh, consumer grade uh, headsets that are usable for something that are meaningful for the, for the, public. So I would say uh, that would be what I would like to work towards, making BCI usable so we can get more people involved. So it will grow, uh, the interest will grow into people, into research, into industries, and there will be more funds and their field will grow even more. So yep, working for usability mainly. Okay. And how do you see this work of making BCIs usable? I think what is needed is an increase in accuracy of non-invasive PCIs because if you, I mean, there are two main ways to get people interested. Either you make something which is invasive, but that solves the issues of some very disabled patients, like uh, let's say the equivalent of deep brain stimulation, but for BCI and everyone's using this and then there will be development of medical equipment and everyone will be using this. So that's one step. And the other possibility is to make something that can be used by anyone, which is way less expensive, but that grows in, in, in interest. And for this to work, I think we need some more capabilities in the decoding uh, accuracies of non-invasive headsets, because it's very nice to be able to do a speller, but uh, people that are healthy, they don't need a speller. They need something that will improve uh, their usability when they're driving, for instance, automatically detecting if they're falling asleep or stuff like this. And you need to have some very high reliability uh, for, for this to work. And I would say, I'm not sure, but I'd say this will come with some hardware breakthrough to increase quality of electrodes or, or, or stuff like this. Because for now, with the headset that we have for commercial use and healthy users, uh, it seems hard to get people really involved with this. Yes. Uh, how would you see the field of BCI neurotechnology, uh, let's say 50, 100 years from now? I mean, this is going to be completely biased. Uh, it's just, I mean, I can provide an answer, but it has not much of value because I'm a BCI scientist and I would like for it to succeed. So the way I see it, uh, we will make we will be able to get people interested into the field and it will be just as used as the phones are right now like everyone's using the internet and cell phones it's just a way to communicate with a computer and then you can have instead of typing with your hands on your on your keyboard on your phone you can just do the same thing with your brain if you can communicate with your with your computer so i see it as a technology that is completely completely integrated into everyday life uh, but that would bring a lot of critical questions, as many people have, have have said, because then you have access to people's brain and it means, okay, instead of creating profiles based on where you click on your internet, you can create uh, profiles based on what kind of thinking you're performing. And 
there's a lot of work that must be done in the ethical field in addition to the research field uh, for this to succeed. But yes, to answer your question, I would see BCIs everywhere in, in this kind of time period. Yeah, thank you for that glimpse into the future. And also, can you provide some advice for those people who might be thinking about submitting their work for BCI Award? What to look for, what to focus on to make it a successful project? I only applied once, so this is limited feedback, I'd say, but uh, just I think it's important to find an angle to to show that the research that you're doing can have an impact. It doesn't have to be in the short term. It has to show, okay, why am I doing this? If you understand why you're doing your research, you will understand the, the, big, the big picture of, uh, of the goal of this research. And then you can just not sell this, but explain why you're doing this to, uh, in, your, in your submission. And it will make it much more interesting because many people I've met think, okay, what I'm doing is just a small part in a small project and it, it's not big enough compared to, uh, to the other submissions. But in truth, if you try to explain what you're doing to someone which is not in the field, you will understand that actually what you're doing has an impact and is making change. So, yep, I would say try to think about the bigger picture and understand why your submission is actually worthy of the nomination or even the prize instead of saying, okay, yeah, uh, hey, what I'm doing is not good enough. Yeah. So what was it for you? What was the why behind your work? I mean, for me, as I mentioned, I, I, I want to make BCIs more usable. And, uh, and I think being able to skip all of this training, because I've been on the receiving part of the BCI training, you know, when you're under this EEG headset for, for hours uh, during weeks, and it's, it's not that interesting training the model itself. And I wanted to make it, to make it better and then say, okay, if I remove this, it's going to have a gigantic impact actually. So. I was myself convinced of the usability of, of, of my project. And then I just heard about the, the existence of these BCI awards and I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to give it a shot and see, see if people agree with me that this is very important or not. And it seems like uh, it, it was considered interesting and important because I, I was a nominee in the 2021 edition. Uh, and uh, what is the best way, Vincent, to learn about your work and contact you? I think the easiest way to contact me is through LinkedIn because it's the less is it, it, maybe you're going to be able to find me easily over there. And there is my email address over there or phone number. It's very easy to get into contact with me. So uh, then if you want to follow what I will be doing, I guess I will be updating this page as well. And you will be able then to find a lab in which I'll be working. And then you can click on the lab, find the publication and stuff like this. And Feel free. I mean, anyone who's interested in what I've been doing or want to discuss what I've done or what I will be doing in the future, feel free to reach out and I'll be happy to discuss it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Vincent. We will add all that information into our podcast notes. And uh, as we're nearing the end of our podcast, is there anything you want to share with our listeners before we end? Yeah, I'd say please, please keep working into the field of BCIs to make it even better than it was. And I'm excited to know that there are so many people that are interested in uh, in BCIs and that are eager to make it grow. I've been listening to your podcast for quite a, quite some time, and there are many more people that I that would think that are into the field and not only in the research and academic part. And it's it's very very pleasant to hear about all of these people. So. Please join us into the field of PCI and make this the best technology ever. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we're finishing on this exciting note. I wish you all possible success, Vincent. I think you did already absolutely amazing work. And I'm sure you have so much amazing work in uh, front of you in the future. So I hope that we will meet in our uh, future podcast and we will hear from you about uh, new exciting things. So thank you very much. Thank you, Milena. Are you a fearless pioneer in the world of brain-computer interfaces? Do you have an amazing project that's pushing the boundaries of what's possible? Then we want to hear from you. The International BCI Award is one of the biggest and most prestigious awards in the BCI world. And the deadline for submission is September 1st. But don't worry, you don't need a top-notch budget or equipment to be a nominee or a winner. 
All it takes is a great idea and the determination to make the impossible possible. So, submit your project now at bci-award.com or find the link in our podcast notes and join us on this incredible journey to explore the world of BCIs. And make sure to listen to our upcoming BCI Award NeuroCareers podcast series for tips and tricks on creating a successful submission. Who knows? You might be the next nominee or winner of the International BCI Award and proudly showcase your nomination on your resume to impress potential employers and establish a successful career in neurotechnologies. But don't stop there. If you are looking for more guidance on succeeding in your careers, book a free consultation with me, your podcast host, Dr. K, at the Institute of Neuro Approaches. So, what are you waiting for? Let's make the impossible possible together.